Mumbai Hospital, Mumbai, India. And he has uh, too many other positions. Uh, it's difficult to enumerate all his positions, but he's a well-known neurosurgeon globally. I'd like also to welcome my colleague and my brother, Professor Ahmad Hagazi. He's Professor of Neurosurgery at the Department of Neurosurgery at Cairo University. He's one of the pioneers of cerebrovascular neurosurgery in Egypt and in all the Middle East. I would like also to welcome the moderator of this session, Professor Hatem Badr. He is a Professor of Neurosurgery and the Chairman of Neurosurgery at Mansoura University. Thanks to all of you for accepting our invitation or for contributing to this activity. Let me also thank all the audience and let me announce that for all the audience who don't have Zoom meeting in their mobiles or laptops, there will be a live stream of this webinar through the YouTube channel of our organization. For all the audience, if you can, if you have any questions, you can participate through the Q&A or through the chat questions, and we will monitor that through the panel by the moderator of this session, Professor Hatem Badr. Now I will give the speech to Hatem to start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nasser. Give me the greatest pleasure to moderate the webinar number 15 of Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons and the Continental Association of Af uh, African Neurosurgical Societies. First speaker is Professor Kiki Turel, Professor and the Head of Neurosurgery Department of Pompeii Hospital, Pompeii, India. Uh, uh, Professor Kiki, as uh, Professor Nasser say, was in one of the eminent uh, neurovascular surgeon uh, known, uh, well known. Uh, so the first, um, uh, uh, the title of his presentation, of, or the title of his first presentation, is a complication avoidance in carotid and the arterectomy. Thank you. Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nasser, Professor Hatim, and my dear friend, Mahmoud Qureshi. I'm very, very happy to be here in the midst of all my good friends from Arabia, from Arabia, from Middle East, and from Egypt. So, uh, I will first start with our uh, favorite birthday. Nowadays, it has become a norm. We cannot shake hands in these COVID times. So it has become traditional to, to say Namaste, which is an Indian symbol which says that my soul honors your soul. I honor the place in you where the entire universe resides. I honor the light, love, truth, beauty and peace within you because it is also within me. In sharing these things, we are united, we are the same and we are one. And we have to be together in our universal fight against this pandemic together. So let us hope uh, that we all sail through this uh, terrible time in a very safe and peaceful manner. My subject today is on complication avoidance. As you know, I'm the chairman for, for the uh, uh, Committee on Complications in Neurosurgery in uh, WFNS. So I want to get this out. So I'm going to talk to you about carotid artery complications, carotid and arterectomy complications. And uh, my first slide, of course, says that uh, my disclosures, and I've seen them all. There's nothing I have not seen. So carotid artery disease, 90% of all extracranial diseases are carotid lesions are caused by atherosclerosis. And only 10% are caused by these other things which are listed over here. So our primary goal of treatment of carotid atherosclerosis is the reason to treat it is to prevent stroke. Take stroke we can't see your screen. We goal. can't see your screen. Sorry? We can't see your screen. You cannot see my screen? Oh. Yeah, we, we saw only the first slide only. No. Now can you see it? No. 
You cannot see my title slide? No. I think you have to load your... Uh, now, yes. no, no, yes. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. So indications, technique, and complication avoidance. My disclosure, complications, I have seen them all. So we're talking about atherosclerosis being the prime suspect for extracranial carotid lesions. And uh, the reason for treating atherosclerosis is to prevent stroke. And there are medical methods of treatment, as you already know. And the combination of dietary modification, physical exercise, and use of aspirin, a statin, and an antihypertensive agent can be expected to give a cumulative relative stroke risk reduction of as much as 80%. But then when this atherosclerosis occurs and causes uh, uh, stroke-like symptoms or TIAs, what do you do? So the indications for intervention is symptomatic carotid cirrhosis between 70 to 99%. You don't treat once it is 100%. Asymptomatic stenosis, even if it is less than 70%, but has an ulcerative plaque. And there is a doubtful or debatable indication of carotid thrombosis, uh, which can be treated if it is occurring within six hours, if the treatment takes place within six hours. Nowadays, people are even operating for stenosis, which is up to 60% or more. So the two types of interventions that we know of are endarterectomy and stenting. Endarterectomy is the most frequently used for non-vascular, non-cardiac vascular surgical procedure in the United States. And the goal, as I told you, is preventing the strokes. The first recorded case was as long back as 51, 1951. And its popularity surged in the 60s and 70s. And by 1980s, it had crossed 100,000 per year so that people were actually questioning whether this was being overdone. And therefore, risk-benefit ratio was being questioned. And therefore, several trials began on this Nasset Afas and whatnot. The most, so then in 2009, it, was, it had crossed 140,000 cases per year. And the numbers have continued to increase since then, even though many potential cases have been subjected to stenting. Hey, are you progressing your slides? Are Sorry? You your, are you moving your slides? No, I'm oh. steady and stable. Uh, I hope. I hope uh, the internet is okay. I, I'm seeing my screen very stable. Oh, no, we are only seeing your first slide. You haven't moved them forward, have you? Oh my, oh my. Okay. We will come back to it. I know this one is not the presentation. Is that not the presentation, the one with the number state? Now yeah. it is fine. No. This is. You can see it now, end to me. Carotid endarterectomy, large studies, yes. Large studies have shown significant benefit if endarterectomy, if more than 70% stenosis and symptomatic. It is also recommended for symptomatic patients even with more than 50% stenosis. And also for asymptomatic patients with over 60% stenosis. So historical trials have all favored endarterectomy over stenting. And several randomized contemporary trials have taken place which I have listed over here, and they all favor CEA. Uh, in as late as 2020, there was a Cochrane review of symptomatic carotid stenosis, 23 trials, 9,753 patients, and the high risk of stroke and death was recorded in stenting patients, and higher risk of stroke, death, and myocardial infarction. Therefore, the conclusion is that stenting for symptomatic carotid stenosis is associated with a high risk of periprocedural stroke or death more than endarterectomy. So, we will summarize that. Are you seeing the slides continuing now? No, it's not progressing when you. It's not progressing? Just move to the other presentation. I'm sure that other, other presentation is not the one which is the number still other presentation. It's the same. Two presentations with the open. It's not this. 
Is it being? Okay. Can you see it now? They can see the first slide. The moment is this. It's all right. The summary. Yeah. You can see the summary slide. Yes. CEA is safe with good protection for ischemia. Proven beneficial long-term outcomes. Multi well-planned studies compared it with the best medical management, and it is of course cost-effective and superior to stenosis or uh, to stenting. And most of these studies compare it with only CEA. Detailed cardiac evaluation is mandatory to minimize to minimize perioperative risks. Can you see this slide of complications now? No, it's just Please summary. Mahmud, it's just the summary we can see. Now, no, it's not moving. What is the matter? Sharing is paused. Bring your sharing window to the front. That is why. That is in front of me. You are screen sharing. Sharing is sharing is paused. So that's the problem. Can you just unpause it? What is the meaning of that? You are now yes. There. No. Again is sharing is paused. Why don't you click on that? Sharing is paused. You click. Huh? Clicking on this yellow line. Sharing is paused. Resume share. Resume share. Sharing is paused. Bring your share with the front. Okay. You are screen sharing. Why don't you keep it this way only? Okay. Yeah. Is this okay? Are you able to see this? Yes, yes, we are seeing this. So you want to leave it like that is fine. So the moment I go on to full screen sharing, yeah. Somehow see again it is yeah, all right. The moment you say play, mm -hmm. now don't say play, we'll just move it to this. Can I think? No. Yes. All right. Yes. So that was now it's okay. So that was the summary which we just mentioned. Now you are seeing the slight complications of CE? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the complications can be divided into, I'm very sorry about this problem. Complications is also a complication of presentation now. Underlying, <laughs> disease, underlying disease or of the technique. The technique can be divided into anesthetic technique or surgical technique. So anesthetic technique is very important and I'll come to it a little later. But uh, the surgical technique is, it can be intraoperative or it can be postoperative. And intraoperative, you can have an embolic stroke or you can have a myocardial in infarct. Postoperatively also, you can have myocardial infarct, but you may have a neck hematoma because the patient remains on blood thinners and you have to leave there for a drain inside. Or there can be an airway compromise. Again, it can be because of the neck hematoma itself. Anesthetic complication, very important. We have seen one significant complication. I'll come to that at the end of the presentation. Important to maintain the MAV within 20% of baseline. It means you must avoid hypotension and at the same time, you must avoid hypertension. And also you must avoid hypocarbia. Patients must be monitored continuously for changes in blood pressure. That is what the anesthetist's role is. So, According to the NASA trial, one in 10 endarterectomy patients experience some medical complication, not directly related to the surgery, and endarterectomy was approximately 1.5 times more likely to trigger medical complications in those patients who have medical history of myocardial infarct, angina, hypertension, and so on. So they are medically complicated patients. So what is the reason for justifying carotid endarterectomy? The benefits of stroke reduction should be there versus the risk of perioperative complications which should be negligible. So requiring that overall morbidity and mortality rates associated with endarterectomy should be low 
That means it should be less than 6% in symptomatic patients and less than 3% in those who are asymptomatic in order to justify intervention. Otherwise, medical treatment is better. So your surgical treatment must produce good results better than what medical treatment can produce. And the reopen trial of carotid stenting randomly assigned patients to receive endarthrectomy or stenting for treatment of symptomatic carotid stenosis. And they found the all-cause mortality for the 857 patients was just 0.8% when they underwent endarectomy. And 120-day combined, any stroke or procedural death rate was 4.2%. I'll come to this one more time a little later. So this is your complication rate. That is 1.4. Post-operative non-fatal stroke, 3.4. Post-operative non-fatal myocardial infarct, 2.1 and patients that have suffered at least one adverse event is almost 7%. What are the predictors? Age 75 years or older, they have more complications. If they have severe hypertension, if carotid endarctomy is done in preparation for CABG or patients having history of angina, ICA thrombosis or ICA stenosis, which is close to the carotid siphon. These are all predictions of complications of endarctomy. So you must study them very carefully. And therefore, the presence of two or more of these risk factors was clearly associated with a nearly two-fold increase in the risk of an adverse event. So these adverse events, they, and these predictors must be very strongly considered before undertaking the patient for surgery. So endarterectomy complications and preoperative assessment risk, the risk of the surgical procedure are related to myocardial infarction and residual mild to severe neurological deficit. So neurologically stable patients, and I'll come to this chart very soon, immediately after this slide. For example, if the patient is neurologically stable, medical risk is not there, angiography risk is not there, endarterectomy risk is just 1%. But those who also have an angiographic risk, the endarterectomy risk is 2%. Those who have an additional medical risk, the risk is 7%. And those who are neurologically not stable, the risk is 10%. So it's very clear, the previous slide, I have just made into a table. So you should have all these things in your mind before undertaking endarterectomy. Evaluation preoperatively is done by necrosal Doppler, which is uh, hardly of any great uh, uh, use for determining surgery. MRA, I'm coming to it in a short while. But most important and uh, commonly used uh, method of investigation is CT angiography. It shows calcification. It shows the anatomy of the artery and its relationship with the bifurcation of the artery with the with the vertebra and the accuracy of the degree of stenosis. Detailed medical evaluation for young stroke patients is mandatory. Detailed cardiology evaluation for everybody. And mind you, antiplatelets are not stopped because we want the blood to keep flowing when we are clamping the carotid. So the commonly used MRI is people still talk about MRI for diagnosis and I'm talking about plaque diagnosis. So you have ultrasound on your left hand, you have echo in the middle, and then you have MRI, 3D CT, and DSA, all vertically arranged slides to the right side. So you can see how they look on individual investigation. One must be able to collect detailed information on this plaque on your, on your MRI, on MRA. The plaque diagnosis of stenoptic lesions, the carotid artery, will give you a prognostic prediction. And it will help you in the selection of treatment strategy and the device to be used. So controlling post-operative embolism that frequently occurs is an important issue. And those who depend on the MRI or MRA for diagnosis, for prediction, they must study this plaque. So the plaque diagnosis now has fully developed. To what extent can embolism following carotid stenting can be predicted? So plaque diagnosis with this new methodology called radar spin echo. And there's a, these are the uh, 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 investigations that you do on uh, sequences that you do on plaque imaging of MRI for the black blood method or BB method. You must remember that the ideal MRI plaque imaging is able to distinguish the lipid component versus the fibrous component and the bleeding characteristics in the plaque. So this is important for us to study before undergoing, before undertaking any treatment. Uh, so at the bottom, you see the echo, how it looks for fibrous plaque, for lipid and for bleeding. The black um, uh, blood shows in the middle and the radar sequences are showing much better the fibrous plaque or the lipid plaque and the bleeding plaque. 
This will help you to distinguish and determine what line of treatment to offer to the patient. So radar is one of the most useful inspection methods to predict post-stenting or post-operative embolism. Operative protocol is all patients we operate on GA, some surgeons do prefer local, propofol cerebral protection, mild hypothermia, so that because of clamping, they require brain metabolism to be a little bit uh, slow down. Continuous easy monitoring, very important. And we give injection heparin, 100 international units per kilogram before you clamp the carotid artery. In an average, we administer about 5,000 units, 5,000 to 6,000 units. Now, surgical factors pertaining to complications in CEA is as follows. Number one, not getting the imaging right. So we already discussed about imaging and we said CT angiography and DSA. Our DSA is a gold standard. So this is what most people rely upon is CT angiography. And these are the slides which are showing distinctly how carotid artery is narrowed by the atheromatous plaque. Now this angiographic factors, as you see stenosis, if the cells of the operated artery is 100%, of course, one does not properly operate. The complication rate seems to be as much as 18%. The commonly used uh, stenosis is 70 to 99%. Complication rate is 6.7. And those who are operating on patients with more than 50%, 50 to 70%, the complication rate is more than similar. If there is stenosis of the contralateral artery, and if it is 100% blocked, the complication rate is 8.4. And those which are 50 to 70 or 70 to 99 is about the same, about 7%. If there is ulcer, again, the complication rate is higher than those who don't have an ulcer. If there's intraluminal thrombosis, the complication rate is much higher, 16%. And there is carotid siphon stenosis, intracranially that means. The carotid their complication rate is 10%. Selecting the patient is very important, a wrong patient selection. So the patients for selection is after TIA or those who have recovered from the stroke completely, after six weeks at least, or those who have a 60 to 99% stenosis. Again, this chart shows you the complication rates for uh, those patients who are asymptomatic, who have a contralateral hemisphere stroke, who have had a vetrober basilar, who have ipsilateral hemisphere, and who have got recent TIAs. So these are all the figures that tells you this percentage of stroke or death and percentage of stroke MI or death. <laughs> if by putting all these figures into one slide, Cochrane database and meta-analysis shows death of 1%, infarct 2%, stroke 3%, clamp-induced ischemia 13%, operated artery irritable benefit deficit 10%, and reperfusion syndrome 1%. Whom, is, whom do we send for stenting or whom do we not operate? Are those who have got carotid dissection, who have a very high cervical carotid aneurysm, those who have a very high carotid bifurcation, Patients who have already had radical neck dissection or radiation, those who have fibromuscular dysplasia, or who have had endotracremia and a restenosis, or who have had contralateral severe stenosis or contralateral carrion low palsy following previous surgery. These are the patients we would not stand. We would also not, oh, those women will send for stenting. We will also not do um, surgery on severe coronary artery disease, recent MI, unstable MI, unstable angina, those who are medically unstable, in other words, who are poor candidates for GA. So I'll give you an example of this gentleman who has a left-sided TIAs. And look at the right side, our angiography, uh, on CT angiography. It's very severe, craggy, irregular carotid. And on the left side, he also has significant stenosis. Now, this is a patient who would be unfavorable for, for endotrectomy, and therefore we send him for stenting. Look for strange anatomy. Look at this. Angiogram, CT angiogram. The left side, look at the, bundle, the, 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 uh, the uh, confusion of the blood vessel. And when it is opened out, you can see how it is. On the left CCA, very large. That's the left CCA being exposed. That's the left CCA. You can see the carotid, how it is very narrow at one point, and then post-stenotic dilatation. And I will show you the video of this. So we have the clamp. We have opened the carotid sheet. <clears throat> and we do a CT angio, uh, we do a uh, ICG, always we do an ICG during the operation. Now I put my tapes and clamps on the common carotid. First, always the sequence of clamping, 
I see common carotid and then the uh, external carotid. So I'm opening this common carotid and going towards the area of stenosis. You can see the intraluminal thrombus. They are actually removing this thrombus during the operation. Mind you, as I just showed you in the statistics, the intraluminal thrombus carries a little, uh, uh, almost a 10% uh, severe prognosis. And then I refashion this carotid artery after removing the thrombus. And this is very abnormal anatomy. So this was the abnormal anatomy which we saw and we were prepared for it. We removed the thrombus and here I am suturing this area completely and removing the clamps. That is the peculiar anatomy that we had with the patient. So a bit. Not exposing high enough. Now how do you measure? So you see a ideal carotid bifurcation at C4. It's a, we call it easy go. If it is slightly higher at C3, we say slow go. If it is above C2, we say no go. And similarly, it can be at C5 or a little lower, we say low go. So ideal bifurcation is at C4 and uh, we can take one level higher or above or below, which is all right for carotid anatomy. How can we measure this high exposure by the spine anatomy, by ECA branches on the lateral angiography, by color changes in the vessel as you see over here. It's hard or soft digital field when you feel it and when you, do, when you do a Doppler auscultation also, but you see the yellow plaque inside and as you move away from the plaque, the artery will look a little bluish, the upper extent of the lesion. Beware of the nerves in the neck, you must know your anatomy, there are important nerves crossing, vagus, be careful whilst cross clamping the carotid. Hypoglossal, gentle retraction, it goes, especially for a high carotid bifurcation, you have to be more careful. Laryngeal vessels, therefore, no deep medial retraction, no circumferential distraction. Also, accessory nerve and ansa hyperosy. And this is the anatomy. And this is at the time of surgery. You can see the sternomasal artery, hypoglossal nerve, very close, but bifurcation is much lower. So you can have the digastric muscle cut away to give you more exposure. I see a protection, getting the sequence of clamping and unclamping correctly. Now, what is the sequence? The sequence is ICE. So I will first clamp, after exposing everything, I will first clamp the I, internal carotid. I will next clamp the C, the common carotid. And I will then clamp the E, which is the external carotid. So my surgery is going to be between C and E. So therefore I clamp the first, the internal carotid, so that that is protected, no more plaques can fly into it. Then I clamp the internal carotid, common carotid rather. And finally, after clamping the common carotid, in case some plaque can get dislodged by clamping itself, it can go in the external carotid. So I clamp the external carotid at the end. And the sequence of unclamping will be the reverse. That means I open the external first so that all the debris can get into the external circulation first of it. Then I open the common carotid because proximal to the common carotid also, there could be blood stagnation and that can also flow up into the external carotid. And finally, after the last sutures are taken, you open the ICE. Steps are positioning of the patient, incision, carotid. And I'll show you all these steps. Application of clamps, arteriotomy, separation of the plaque, closure of the vessels, and re-establishment of the flow. So that's the, one of the, my earliest patients I operated, maybe some 20, 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago. And uh, it's a young Parsi lady, a very long neck, beautiful uh, neck for dissection. Uh, she had come with TIAs. She was almost 75 years old. And uh, she stayed very close to the hospital in South Mumbai. And you can see me now doing the arteriotomy, uh, cutting the internal carotid artery, common carotid artery, getting into the internal carotid, identifying the plaque. Simple, gentle dissection between the plaque and the intima. And separating it, irrigating, as soon as we come to the end of the plaque, we just cut it sharply with a sharp dissecting scissors, mids and bomb scissors. Now this is going in the external carotid. So gently pull it out. You don't need to chase it any further. It will come out. And then start dissecting very gently from the entire intima of the carotid. And go as high as it goes into the internal carotid. But you don't have to chase the entire plaque. Where it narrows down and tapers off, that's the place, as you see now, we cut off. There you are. That's the point to cut it off. So that's the plaque. You can see the lumen inside from which the blood was flowing. And then 
at the end, you start removing all those little fringes of atheroma, which are likely to fly once the clamps are open. So you take away all these little things. If there are some loose tags which cannot be taken out, then you tag them with tag sutures. So many patients may require tag sutures. And once the arterial lumen is absolutely clean, you keep washing it with heparin solution and start suturing from distal to proximal, from internal carotid, go down, can come to the uh, bifurcation and then down to the common carotid. And just towards the end, as you reach the last two suture lengths, uh, the sutures are taken at five to eight millimeter distance. And towards the end, you just open the uh, external carotid or common carotid clamp see if there is any bleeding coming out from the holes. As you can see, there is no bleeding. Then, then you want to apply the clamp, then release the external clamp first. So that all the atheroma can go out from there. Once the external clamp is released, release the common carotid clamp and then the internal carotid clamp. If there are tiny oozing points, you can just simply cover with fibula or surgery cell. There will be oozing because the patient is on blood thinners. And therefore, you need to keep a, a soft glove drain inside. And then you close the neck wound and watch for the next wedding. Patient goes to the ICU for the first 24 hours. It's not moving. Yeah. We like to mark the carotid artery. I did not show it to you in that first picture. But we realized that in order to get a very nice regular cut, we should mark the incision with a metal in blue pencil. Now, this is a patient with an internal carotid block, a common carotid cell of siphon block. And the lady, you can see on the angiogram, the carotid is, the cerebral circulation only coming from the opposite side. That carotid is quite significantly blocked. So, this is the plaque after removal of the surgery. And this is the post-operative angiogram. You can see the stand dilatation after the plaque is removed. And you can see the whole carotid, beautiful circulation flowing through. And that's the lady with no deficit post-operatively. This is a pre-op CE of another patient. That's the operation. That's the common carotid being identified. That's the carotid sheet being separated. We apply clamps, common carotid clamp. First internal carotid already applied, then the common carotid, and then the external carotid. I'm making an incision directly Onto the plaque, I can feel the plaque externally also. Separate the, separate the coat, the vessel coat from the atheroma. Simple, just pick out the atheroma, whole atheroma in one piece. And there it comes out. And then look out for all the loose tags, small little pieces of atheroma which are left behind. Clean them out wash the lumen and start closing. As I showed you, open the last butt, allow the carotid to bleed a little bit so that the stagnant blood will flow out. And then you apply your last sutures. If there's still some bleeding, you reapply the clamp. Look at the point of bleeding, reapply additional sutures. Make sure that everything is completely stopped before you remove the clamp. Now we remove the external clamp, there's no bleeding. Remove the common clamp, no bleeding, and finally remove the internal carotid clamp. Put some surgery cell to prevent oozing or to block the, to cover the oozing points. And yes, I forgot to tell you that we also clamp the, uh, 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 the external carotid supply to the uh, thyroid artery, the superior thyroid artery. That also is clamped by a small aneurysm clip. Gentle pressure for a few minutes to stop the oozing. And then we move on. So why should someone have a stroke in spite of such a good operation? A piece of debris, as I showed you, or air can go to the brain. And what do you do? How do you protect the brain? You give heparin bolus early, as, it, as I told you, 5,000 units. Minimal manipulation of the arteries, carotid artery, common carotid, internal carotid. There could be loose fragments. There could be a problem of high or low exposure. And then you must cut the ligastric or the omohyoid, depending on where the muscle is obstructing you and expose the ICA very well above the plaque, well above the plaque. How do you protect the brain from ICA emboli? You must have EEG notification. 
and clamps are applied as usual ICA first, then CCA, then, IC, then ECA. Arteriotomy with 11 blade and pot scissors, shunt if required. Plaque removal, I already told you and I showed you, must, be, must make very careful attention to retained fragments. The second reason why someone could have a stroke is that there is not enough blood flow. And that means is the shunt really required? How many you require it? When the patient is awake, if you're doing awake surgery, the patient is showing deficit within 60 seconds of application of the clamp. Or the stump pressure is less than 50 millimeters. Or if the TCD shows MCA velocity 0 to 15% pre-clamp, or the EG shows unilateral attenuation, or the SSCP shows 50% amplitude decrease. These are all the indicators that the shunt is required. So this is a way to do your carotid back pressure measurement. You just put a clamp on the common carotid and put a needle into the common carotid and then check the pressure and then clamp the external carotid and check the pressure. Both of them, one after the other. So if you decide that the pressure that the patient requires uh, uh, additional blood supply, um, then you'll have to put a shunt. You, in, you introduce a shunt into the uh, internal carotid first, put a clamp over there on the shunt, and then allow the blood and debris and everything, whatever it is, to flow out. And once that flows out, you insert the lower end into the common carotid and then put again a snare over there and put a clamp and uh, allow the blood to flow through the shunt whilst your end arterectomy is in progress. At that time, you have enough leisure time. You can leisurely remove your plaque because you have a shunt in place. So this is the shunt in place. How do you know the shunt is working? There'll be recovery of EEG or SSCP if it has become, um, if it has gone down. And the vascular uh, doctor also will show you the MCA flow and the uh, return of RCBF. And, and you can also do a Doppler of the shunt. And you can see that the flow is very good. So use of shunt in CEA, severe ischemia occurred in 7.2% of the cases, but clear spontaneously in about half of them. And in those with persistent ischemia, the rate of severe stroke was very high while, shunt protect, while shunting protected against the stroke in such cases. But if the ischemia did not occur, in spite of the, uh, in spite of the shunt, it's for not using the shunt, then the stroke, stroke, stroke rate will be higher with shunting, although not so as high as in unshunted cases with severe ischemia. So carotid endotomy complications might be reduced by selectively shunting only for a few persistent ischemia. Monitoring of cerebral ischemia would be essential to selective shunting. But I don't use the shunt very frequently. It's very, very uncommonly used. And finally, what would you do if the vessel occludes postoperatively and gives rise to a stroke? So this is a patient who's showing monitoring changes 43 minutes down the operation while the suturing of the lateral wall is still going on. Then you do a black, black bleeding check. You release the internal carotid clamp and just allow the blood to flow back and check it out and immediately, if there's a thrombus, release a thrombus and then start suturing all over again. The closure is done by putting a carotid sheet uh, hemobag, as I told you earlier. Everything is closed with 3-0 vicryl, skin is stapled with 4-0 and no reversal of heparin, mind you. Uh, so our current protocol is liberal use of stacking sutures whenever those uh, free uh, uh, fragments are tacking around. Uh, careful attention to end arterectomy bed, Gore-Tex patch if it is required, if the arterial wall is significantly damaged, and uh, rapid discharge, the first night in ICU, second day in the transfer to the floor, and maybe go home the same evening, or maybe next day. If the complications have to occur, they would occur within 24 hours, and continue aspirin for a lifetime. So avoid bilateral end arterectomy due to significant impairment of the hypoxic drive. Don't do bilateral at the same time. Do one side, make sure all the lower cranial nerves are functioning very well, and then go on to the opposite side. Aspirin for lifetime should not be stopped. Pass usage, it, it depends on uh, your philosophy and the kind of artery you're dealing with. But mind you, mesospasm can occur. Now this is a patient who has got a very fleshy thrombus, very fleshy wide artery wall, which is very difficult for primary closure. And in that case, you may require a patch. This is a fabric patch. And uh, operative factors are when shunt is used, the complication rate is 8.2. When it is not used, 5.9, which means that the patient has got a better cerebral reserve. When the patch graft is used, complication rate is low. Uh, 
but when it is uh, used, the patch graph, no, when it is patch graph is used, the complication rate is 5%, but when it is not used, 8%, when it is really needed. And mind you, when endarterectomy and CABG is done, 18% complication rate. Some patients develop vasospasm. It's very uncommon. I have only seen it one time. So then you remove or reposition the offending device, administer vasodilators, complete the procedure very quickly, induce hypertension because naturally the vasospasm is going to reduce the blood flow. And you may use angioplasty for those vasospasm which do not respond to your medical treatment. What's going to change carotid uh, 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 surgery? It is this, not the carotid stent, but it is going to be PCSK9. So this is a drug called Evoliosumab, which is a drug which will target the protein. This protein, PCSK9, is the one which reduces the liver's ability to remove the bad cholesterol. And so you use this drug to reverse this protein. And that may be probably the answer for all carotid artery uh, problems. The relationship of uh, post-operative hypertension to complications is very severe and poorly understood clinical problem, and which is defined as a sustained elevation of systolic pressure, more than 200 millimeter requiring pharmacological control occurred in about 19% of 253 procedures, pretty high. So preoperative hypertension is the single most important determinant in the development of post-operative hypertension. And the incidence of preoperative hypertension in patients who developed this post-operative was 80% compared to 57% in those who do not develop this complication. So there was a significant increased incidence of neurological deficit and operative mortality rate in the group who developed this post-operative hypertension. Five neurological deficits in the group who developed this and the incidence of neurological deficit in the group who did not develop hypertension was 3.4%. And the only deaths were in this post-operative hypertensive group. The hypertensive patient is at a greater risk for post-operative hypertension, which is associated with increased neurological mobility and mortality. Now, if you have time, I will show you one case of post-operative hypertension. Uh, so I need the moderator to agree or not agree to it. This is a ICA blog. This is a complication I've had, and I want to show it. Do you agree? Hello? Are you listening to me? Yes, Kiki, we are listening to you. So do, do, you do you have another three minutes to show this complication? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so this is a 52-year-old man. Um, he had TIAs only for one month. Recurrent episodes of dysphagia lasting 15 to 30 minutes. Episode lasting for a month. He had several risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all bad news for 15 years. Now he had these TIAs and he had a carotid stenosis, which is shown, the TIA is shown by the brain scan and the carotid stenosis is shown by the yellow arrow in the MRA. Now I'm opening this artery very straightforward operation as far as the surgery was concerned. We do the same procedure. Now we do the incision on the common carotid and internal carotid and nicely and safely remove this plaque, completely clean operation and uh, remove all the plaque, check, check the post-operative, check the before applying the last sutures, allow the blood to flow out from the common carotid clamp, then remove the external clamp remove the thyroid clamp, remove the common carotid clamp, and there is no bleeding, absolutely perfect. And now remove the internal carotid clamp. You can see it's dry feel, completely dry feel. Now I remove the final clamp. I do the ICG, very good flow in all the arteries. Of course, I put my surgery cell as usual and remove the uh, muscle uh, clamps and then I start suturing and close the wound. As I go down to my office, within a few minutes, five minutes, I get a call that the patient's wound is actually oozing blood. The blood is coming out from the patient's wound and uh, there is panic. 
the blood pressure has gone up to 220 millimeters. The sequence of events during extubation, the patient's blood pressure went up to 200. There was a carotid blowout and the blood was coming out through the neck wound. It was controlled by manual compression by my assistant. Then I went up and I saw the problem. The, all the instruments were already given away for sterilization. Operation room was in panic. There was somebody just compressing the carotid artery and we waited for the instruments to come. As long as 40 minutes, there was carotid compression. But then as soon as the instruments were ready, I opened the wound and repaired. I just saw one tiny little bleeding point very close to the common carotid, internal carotid junction. I just had to repair that one point with just one stitch. We took the patient, uh, we kept the patient ventilated, hypodense area in the right hemisphere, few patchy hypodense areas on the CT scan, image at post operative. We did the CT angiography also at the same time. Very good cross flow, as you can see. Excellent. But, but what did he have? He had MCA infarct, edema, mass effect, which is an octomy. We did a decompressive. So there was the MCA infarct, edema, and there's mass effect. Required decompressive craniotomy on December 18th, four days later. Post operatively developed multiple episodes of sympathetic storms, which were managed with beta blockers. Patient on December 23rd, barely responding to pain. No improvement in neurological status, vegetative state, tracheostomy done, PEC done, and this is his MRI. A very, a very, bad, a very, bad, a very bad outcome of the carotid artery and uh, per compression to stop it while the instruments were getting ready. This is a patient on March 14th. It's barely responding, barely opening eyes. He developed multiple complications, resistant urinary tract infection, renal failure, requiring dialysis, ventilator associated pneumonia, septicemia, pleural effusion, prolonged ICU stay, horrendous expenses, in May, he's just opening eyes. He's still there in the high dependency unit. Just opening eyes, barely obeying commands. What have we learned? That we must maintain the blood pressure even post-operatively. It must not be allowed to go up beyond his pre-op level. Therefore, the important role of the anesthetist. Presence of pre-operative risk factors, we must consider that this patient had all the risk factors which are liable to create more complications, morbidity, mortality, must discuss that with the patient's family. We had discussed that. Fortunately, we came out and when the patient started bleeding from the carotid, we again came out and explained to the family. So every complication was being discussed. Very important point in preventing these legal complications is to keep a continuous uh, communication stream open with the family. Be honest, be upfront, and disclose whatever is required to be disclosed and uh, keep them into confidence so that they do not uh, feel uh, that you are hiding something and make them understand that you are giving your best, that you are doing your best, but it is a disease and it is the procedure which is uh, having these uh, risk factors. But I must say that despite these complications, this is the only complication we have had, mind you, in my series. So despite these complications, carotid endarctectomy remains the gold standard for treating stenosis in selected symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Accurate perioperative diagnosis and evaluation may help us develop a practical approach to a more beneficial and accurate surgical strategy. Remember, patient education at all times, before operation and after operation, is key. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Kiki, thank you, Professor Kiki, for uh, for this comprehensive presentation. Now I have to introduce Professor Ahmed Higazi, Professor of Neurosurgery, Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University, and he is eminent figure in neurovascular surgery. The title of his presentation 
uh, extracranial, intracranial bypass institutional experience. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ahmed? Okay. Uh, I, I must express how happy I am today to be among you because uh, uh, Dr. Nasser Landur has ordered me to be here and this is quite an honor for me and uh, something also that I would like to express is that uh, I'm very honored to be with Professor Keki Torel who I I know very much because uh, I've worked in Mumbai for six months, actually. I never had the opportunity to work with Dr. Torel, but I am a student of Dr. Uh, Atul Goel in KEM. And I've worked in KEM for six months. And uh, Dr. Goel is a very good and close friend to Dr. Torel. And so uh, uh, he reminds me of my time in India, which was actually the best six months of my life. I did enjoy my stay there and I've learned a lot. And uh, I, I learned actually carotid endotrectomy in Mumbai. Uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Trimurti Natkarni was still working in uh, KEM and he was the one who was doing carotid endotrectomy. Though I don't do myself carotid endotrectomy, yet it is an extremely beneficial thing for me uh, because I've always had the opportunity to uh, uh, do neck dissections all the time and uh, and the knowledge of carotid artery dissection has been a tremendous help for me. Uh, today I would be very happy to uh, show you uh, a very small presentation on our experience with uh, extracranial to intracranial bypass surgery uh, which I have actually introduced into this country uh, back in 2005, 2006, directly after coming back from uh, a tour through uh, India, Germany, and the United States to learn this procedure. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience, and uh, this, this is a very old presentation. It is actually the uh, very early presentation on the initial number of cases that we've performed uh, it's only got 31 cases, but right now we have gone actually beyond 400 cases. So uh, I hope you'd be happy with the presentation and we'll start by going ahead. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce something uh, that I think most of us know. Uh, you know that before World War I, uh, all vascular injuries were treated by uh, vascular ligation and they ultimately resulted in an amputation. Uh, the world at that time did not have any knowledge of how va vessels could be repaired, repaired. and uh, it was this guy who was a French officer by the name of Alexis Carrel who uh, actually did a lot of research at that time uh, on re-anastomosing blood vessels, and he actually founded the first technique uh, ever devised for performing a, an anastomosis, which is the triangulation technique that we still use up till today. Uh, he ended up uh, doing transplantations because of his uh, devising a new technique uh, for anastomosing blood vessels and for that, he did not only introduce uh, vascular repair, but he introduced also the uh, signs of transplantation. And for his efforts in uh, the medical field, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in Medicine in 1940. Actually, uh, he did succeed in repairing major vessels uh, and this resulted in doing renal transplants at that time. Uh, anastomosing vessels smaller than two millimeters in size remained extremely difficult. So I would like to point out to our audience that the two millimeter barrier eluded the whole world for about 60 years because uh, Alexis Carrel 
successfully anastomosed vessels larger than two millimeters in size in 1914. And it was not before the late 50s and early 60s until the operating microscope was introduced that uh, we started to develop techniques of anastomosing small vessels uh, that are actually less than two millimeters in size. Right now, the current practice worldwide is not to allow a surgeon to be able to operate uh, micro, micro vessels unless he can successfully produce long-term patency in more than 98% of his vessels in vessels that are 0.8 millimeters in size. So you see this massive difference has come actually because of the introduction of the operating microscope. Of course, everyone knows Professor Ghazi Yashagil, who uh, introduced the ECIC bypass for the first time in history. And uh, for the first time in history, he was able to perform a superficial temporal to middle cerebral artery bypass. It was a long story, and uh, he initially went to Burlington in the United States in order to be able to learn microvascular anastomosis. And then he thought, well, why not go ahead and do uh, East IC bypass patients with strokes? And at that time, he started doing uh, uh, ECIC bypass in the form of superficial temporal to middle cerebral artery bypass. And he recorded the first successful anastomosis on the 31st of December, 1967. The 31st of December of 1967. And this was the New Year's Eve. And exactly one day later on the 1st of January of 1968, in Burlington, the second anastomosis was performed. This is something that I would like uh, to be pointed out very well, that people could not be... The uh, surgeon attempting microvascular anastomosis should not go ahead and operate on patients unless he has a high success rate in the lab so you have to keep working in the lab until you get a very high success rate. Now, this is uh, an enterocyte anastomosis between the femoral artery and the femoral vein in rats. Uh, I worked in the lab for about four years until we were able, along with the team that I was working with, to uh, obtain a 98% long-term patency for performing microvascular and astomotic procedures. And this finally culminated in our being uh, able to acquire the ability to operate on patients. We've actually documented our lab work at that time, and we've also published this. And luckily enough, we've published the first paper on microvascular anastomosis using this technique in New India also. So uh, you see that India has a lot to do with uh, all the work that we've done. Uh, the number of patients that we have operated is quite large. Right now, we have gone beyond 350 cases. And uh, the indication that we are operating for patients for currently include patients with hemodynamic cerebral ischemia, patients with moya moya disease. I get a lot of patients with moya moya disease referred to me from all over the uh, country and from all over the Arab world, because uh, once they realized that somebody here is doing these procedures, uh, they started coming in. And in addition, we also do uh, high flow bypasses for flow replacement in patients with uh, uh, non-clippable aneurysms and also in patients with uh, aggressive skull-based tumors that require vascular sacrifice. Uh, 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 I would like to uh, show you some cases. Now, uh, this patient was among the first patients that we've operated. We've actually operated him in 2006. Uh, he was a patient with a right total carotid artery occlusion. Now, this is, this is something that I would like to point out because uh, Dr. Turel was uh, discussing carotid endotrectomy. And uh, 
at first, when they started to uh, operate patients with carotid endotrectomy after the introduction of carotid endotrectomy, they realized that uh, there exists a number of patients that cannot be helped by carotid endotrectomy. Sometimes the carotid bifurcation is extremely high. Sometimes the ephraimatous plaque extends so deep into the internal carotid artery and goes intracranially and so on. So because of the, uh, the, uh, the various uh, mishaps that, uh, and the various problems that are inherent with patients that undergo carotid endotrectomy, there still remains a number of patients for whom carotid endotrectomy cannot be done sometimes. So uh, that's why they originally uh, uh, devised the superficial temporal to middle cerebral artery procedure because they wanted to uh, treat those patients who are not amenable for treatment with carotid endotrectomy. Uh, this patient was one of the first patients that we've operated. Uh, this is a very old video, back to 2006. Uh, and we started out first doing low flow bypasses. Uh, this is the isolation of the M3 and M4 division of the MCA. Here's the uh, preparation of the donor vessel and the preparation of the recipient vessel. Then the anastomosis is being created. This is a omniliter vessel. This is the suturing technique. Over time, the suturing technique that we've been using has changed a lot. So, uh, uh, and actually we've published, more. this is a very well functioning anastomosis. You can see the smooth flow in the blood vessel uh, after the anastomosis. When we started out doing this in the beginning, it was very difficult for us because the anesthetists didn't know how to put those patients under anesthesia. And the radiologists never knew what to look for, for these patients. But gradually, after introduction of the technique, the anesthetists picked up with the surgeons and the radiologists picked up with us. This uh, is uh, tool that I use all the time, which is the transcranial color-coded duplex. Uh, it's extremely helpful because it gives me not only an idea about whether my anastomoses are functioning or not, but it can quantify the function of the anastomosis. It can tell me whether the anastomosis is fully functional, how many vessels are filling from the anastomosis. And uh, this was actually introduced into the country by one of our pioneers, uh, 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 one, one of the pioneers in the Middle East, actually, in uh, <clears throat> neurosomology. Uh, a colleague of ours in uh, in Cairo University, and ever since he introduced this uh, TCD, it's been extremely helpful for us to document the blood flow in the vessels after surgery. This is uh, very helpful, and you can see a very widely patent anastomosis over here. Uh, this is an example of a high flow bypass patient that uh, was among the first patients that we've had uh, suffering from a problem that necessitated the performance of a high flow bypass. He was actually coming with a giant uh, carotid artery aneurysm at the cavernous sinus. And because the aneurysm was so huge, this guy came to us with a massive facial palsy and a complete, of, complete ophthalmoplegia. So uh, I told him that the best solution for him would be to perform a high flow bypass. And we used a radial artery graft in this patient between the common carotid artery and the M2. This is the uh, neck dissection uh, that we perform usually. This is the radial artery exposure. I always like to expose the radial artery as long as possible because you never know how much length you would like to need. And usually I uh, mark the surface of the radial artery as you can see so that I can make sure that the artery is not twisting as I make the tunnel to pass the artery from the neck all the way into the sylvian fissure. Uh, here is uh, the neck dissection. I think we've had enough of that. Dr. Terrell has shown us more than we should see. 
but here's the common carotid artery, external carotid artery, internal carotid artery, the 12th nerve, and the posterior belly of digastric. I know that Dr. Terrell would usually uh, cut the posterior belly of the digastric uh, many times, but I never do that actually because most of the cases I usually need the posterior belly of the digastric to identify the facial nerve. So uh, I don't usually cut it unless severely needed. After I identify the facial nerve, we, we go ahead and cut it, but not before that. Uh, I think we'll uh, run over that. This is the exposure of the MCA. And here is the performance of the uh, albiantric cranial anastomosis. This takes uh, quite some time because I have to uh, do a very wide exposure of the sylvian fissure uh, to get myself as close as possible to the artery because it's quite a deep field. Uh, and in order to have manual dexterity, I need to have the sylvian fissure wide open. So it is quite important for me to uh, dissect the sylvian fissure and take my time dissecting the sylvian fissure until I have adequate exposure of the M2 vessel. Uh, sometimes I use the uh, temporal division of the M2, sometimes I use the frontal division of the M2. Any of these is just fair game, uh, so long as you can adequately expose and uh, be completely relaxed while performing the anastomosis. The same principles apply performing the high flow bypass is a lot easier for me than the low flow bypass because the vessels are much bigger. Mm. Uh, here's the uh, preparation of the uh, uh, side branches that are running off the uh, M2. And then we pass the rubber dam underneath the M2 and the anastomosis is performed in the usual manner, exactly the same way a low flow anastomosis, like you would do with any microvascular anastomosis. The principles always apply and the principles are always the same. Yep. One thing that I would like to point out is that uh, I never use saphenous vein uh, for performing high flow grafts. I always use the radial artery. I never use the saphenous vein because the, the blood flow to the saphenous vein is massive. And usually uh, because of the massive inflow, the patients usually can't do this very hard blood flow. Um, this is the completion of the anastomosis between the radial artery and the MCA. And finally, the uh, intraoperative pictures. This is one of the first pictures that we've had for a CT angiography of a patient who had undergone uh, a superficial temporal artery to middle cerebral artery bypass. And actually, it's quite funny because uh, the radiologist who did this uh, CT angiography, he never really knew what was going on. So he said, we are seeing abnormal vessels that are passing through the craniotomy and anastomosing and providing blood supply to the brain. So, of course, the poor guy never knew that there's something called an intracranial anastomosis. So, when he spoke with him later on, he was very happy. Uh, this also, uh, th this, this was actually one of the problems that I had because sometimes, especially with high flow bypasses, the blood flow. Uh, going through the uh, radial artery sometimes becomes extremely massive. And these patients might come with hypertension, they might develop hyperperfusion syndromes, and sometimes uh, they might complain of a constant headache because the brain sometimes cannot just take care of the uh, massive amount of blood that's being uh, poured into the brain. But the, uh, this is something that I've never been able to find a solution to. It eludes me up till now. And I don't think it is possible to solve this issue uh, when too much blood is going into the brain. And as you can see over here from the transcranial color coded duplex, this patient was receiving more than 200 milliliters of blood per second uh, into his cerebral hemisphere through this uh, anastomosis. Uh, we've had non-functioning anastomoses and uh, we've had one mortality up till now in these series. Uh, this was a patient who developed a hyperperfusion syndrome and this patient actually taught us a lot because he taught us never to go into surgery 
unless we have labitalol with us, which is a combined alpha channel and beta channel blocker, and it really does save lives. When patients develop this procedure, it usually is extremely helpful to have them do that. This is a picture of one of the early ICA aneurysms that we've performed. As you can see, there's a massive ICA aneurysm at the skull base. And uh, as you can see, there's no petrous bone. This guy had even lost hearing and lost facial nerve function. This is the, uh, as you can see, the uh, radial artery graft that's going through the uh, brain and anastomosing with the end tube and is actually providing the sole blood supply the hemisphere on that side. And this is again the uh, confirmation. These are some of the papers that we've published uh, on our initial experience with the issue. Uh, one paper, the ECIC bypass anastomosis, review of our preliminary experience at our center. And this is another paper on the technique that we use for the uh, microvascular anastomosis, the 11 o'clock heel first technique, and so on. So uh, it's been, uh, this is another paper that I've published with uh, Dr. Shaker uh, when I was working with Dr. Shaker on the use of uh, in situ microvascular anastomosis. And this paper was, uh, was highly cited a lot of times actually. And in the end, uh, I would like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity for this uh, small presentation on our experience with uh, ECIC bypass. Uh, I'm very happy that we've been able to introduce this procedure to help a lot of patients in our country. And uh, I, I, I would like also to point out that the uh, rules of the game in our poor countries are quite different from the rules in other countries throughout the whole world. So uh, I think there will be a place for vascular surgery in, the, in, our, in our part of the world, and it will remain to offer help for many patients in years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. I'm sorry, but the connection is quite poor. Uh, I really cannot hear a lot. Ahmed, the voice is very clear. I think the problem is at Hatem Internet. Yes, I think I think I, I can hear your voice very clearly, but Dr. Hatem's voice cannot be heard. We can't hear Hatem. Can't hear. Anyhow, uh, Ahmed, it's really a great talk. I'm I'm so proud to have two of the best folks today, Professor Kiki have uh, gave us a very, very impressive and, uh, and excellent presentation. And Professor Ahmad Hegazi did the same. And both topics are related to each other. And I suggest to do an open discussion before we move to the third topic, because the previous two topics are related to each other. Can I think I we have Professor Osama al -Ghannam. Yes, please. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to see all of you, Professor Qureshi and uh, Torel. I haven't seen you years ago, and all my friends, Professor Madhagazi as well. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the talks. Really, I enjoyed listening to you. I just wanted to ask uh, Professor Torel, how frequent do you do uh, the carotid um uh, for established cases of infarction, or you usually uh, select the cases while are in TA only. And 
Uh, did you come across of cases become hemiplegic after the uh, carotid stenting, uh, carotid artery uh, endarterectomy, while they preoperative they presented only with uh, TIA? That's number one. Number two, I'm sure you do a lot of tests to uh, to guard against post-operative infarction because clamping, if it's more than 20 minutes, probably uh, may lead to, so I, I've seen you doing shunting and you did the indication shunting, but you do before uh, that in clinically, do you do metastasis test or cross carotid compression or anything to tell you that the carotid on the upside wouldn't tolerate that clamping during surgery or not? Thank you. So actually the voice was very uh, shaky. Your question is whether we should uh, whether we should be doing an endarterectomy on patients with an infarct. Is that the question? Yeah. Following an infarct? Yes. So if the patient already has a neurological deficit following infarct, mm. which is not uh, reversing, even if it is mm. a late deficit, even if it is reversing a little later, it, it's not typical TIA, but reversible neurological deficit, there is a role for endarterectomy. But if it is a dead brain, infarcted brain, there is uh, clearly no uh, help that you can give by doing endarterectomy. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is to prevent stroke, but a stroke has already established permanently. There's little you can do to offer. I don't know if you can hear me. I cannot hear anybody. Yes, Dr. Torrell, yes. I can hear you now, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, go on, please. So, so uh, it, it, was my answer already heard by anybody, the first answer? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you don't operate an already infected area. That's excellent. But the problem in your problem in our society, not in yours, that uh, most of the patients who presented with TIAs, they don't come to us, or come to neurologists, and they go on medical treatment, and uh, very rare to come. And if you say, I'm okay, why should you operate? In you might have some post operative uh, complications. Uh, that's why uh, I'm asking that. Because some surgeons, they do, not myself, of course. They do surgery uh, uh, in cases of they have uh, some infarction. They are hemiparetic, but they do. Uh, but I don't think it's a good thing to do. The, the second question was, uh, uh, any clinical tests before doing surgery or before doing the shunting during clamping of the carotids? Clinical, clinical tests on the patient, uh, the usual Protocol, I've already shown you the slide. And when you are doing the shunt, of course, we have the EEG and the SSEP. These two are very easy to perform. There are people talk about RCBF, the uh, 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 perfusion, uh, and uh, also Doppler of the MCA. If you have a good uh, sonologist who can do an extra, extra cranial Doppler of the MCA, that also is a very useful test. But yes, EEG and that's EGSS all is good. Just, just all is good. But, but uh, when you do EEG or things, you are not compressing the carotid. The, the point is that all the point goes around. When I do clamping of the carotids and its branches, would the patient yes. tolerate or not? That's the point. So you see, see, but, but when you do EEG and start or things, it wouldn't tell you the compression because you are not compressing the carotids. Okay. No. Good. Uh, can can somebody uh, who has a good signal can you answer? Can you put the question again? I think uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, can hear very well. Dr. Ahmed, can you tell me what he is talking? Uh, I really cannot hear him very well, but if I think he's uh, talking about whether uh, a compression test can be performed before surgery 
uh, to determine whether this patient would be able to uh, withstand the uh, intraoperative clamping. Yeah, that is a balloon occlusion test which we normally have heard of people are doing for various other cerebrovascular procedures. Um, balloon occlusion test for 20 minutes with some hypotension. Okay. Yeah, but I have never done it for, for a patient who is going to undertake parotid endotrectomy. I, I, I also remember one time I was in India and I met uh, Dr. Robinson Gupta. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he was showing us at that time the performance of carotid endotrectomy. And he said, uh, if, if complications are going to happen, they are going to happen regardless of the technique and regardless of the time. <laughs> because he, he was mentioning that he had operated patients uh, with a very short surgical procedure, as short as uh, five to six minutes or 10 minutes. And he'd also operated patients who took more than an hour and a half. And uh, in the end, it really didn't make that much of a difference. And he was reporting that uh, his successor, who actually succeeded him in Newcastle, was operating with all sorts of hi-fi stuff and using all forms of intraoperative EEG and things like that. He was, he was saying that if you see the operating room right now, you'd think yourself in NASA, not in, an <laughs> operating room in a hospital, but it really never did make that much of a difference. The difference really depends upon technique in the end and well, the case selection. Well, uh, as well, I think it depends also on the collaterals and the uh, arterial tree. Are they pathological or healthy, good? They, it's not just, I know that, that of course. Okay, uh, but, but I didn't see you yes. do uh, you do grafting or uh, patch grafting or resection at all in your cases? Because sometimes the wall, uh, when you excise the um, uh, strombo thrombotic part, it's it's very frayed arteries. There's no more tolerate uh, any any normal pressure. So some people they prefer to with a patch or even replace the segment with with carotid. Uh, end to end on both sides. I, I think the literature is overemphasizing on patch and on overemphasizing on tacky sutures also. We have usually we do not find the need for a patch, nor for even for tacking sutures. Very occasionally, one requires it. So, but the literature, you know, uh, shows you different data, and maybe different people have a different approach to it. I have had very uh, narrow arteries, very uh, you know, small, small lumen artery, and I have managed to close the artery very well, effectively, by direct suturing, uh, without compromising the lumen. I have not found the need to do a patch. Uh, but of course, if somebody is uncomfortable with it, he can use it. There is nothing uh, much to it, except that it might take a few minutes more. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in fact, I'm scolding Professor Hagazi that before touching the patient, I think you have to go to the lab working hard. Um, you remind me of the old dear days in United Kingdom. So that what you used to do the um, on copper star right to do into in and into side and then radioactive carbon for chain. And uh, nowadays, what I advise my junior staff is to work on the um, Placenta. They bring placenta from the gynecological department, and then they train uh, how to do anastomosis with these blood vessels. I think this is the only way because it's not easy to bring a uh, copper star um, and then anesthetize. You need a, a very special animal um, lab as well. No, so, well, well, I think I think this is a very important thing to point out because uh, I've performed uh, microvascular anastomosis on more than four thousand rats. Oh. And uh, I did not only work with rats, but I also worked with canines, uh, lots of dogs. I've also worked with cats. Uh, mm -hmm. I've worked with sheep. Uh, so, so it is extremely important that uh, anyone doing vascular surgery would start his life in the lab first. Because mm -hmm. uh, learning microvascular, especially with, with microvascular surgery, learning microvascular and asthmatic procedures on patients is quite hazardous. And it takes a long time and it has a very uh, long learning curve. 
that you have to go through and you have to be completely honest with yourself actually uh, because uh, otherwise uh, if you are not successful in the lab 100% uh, you're going to find yourself dealing with, a, with an enormous number of issues on the patient that you can never take care of. So uh, at least you can take care of the anastomosis part. But there are lots of other things that appear to you in the patient. For example, the direction of the recipient vessel, because you need a recipient vessel that would be uh, in the direction of your right hand so that you can perform the anastomosis correctly. Uh, so choosing a good recipient, finding good length of a donor vessel is sometimes problematic. Choosing the best donor vessel to use is sometimes problematic. Uh, so when you master the anastomosis, at least you have one thing out of the way because you have a lot of variables that, are, that you're going to be dealing with intraoperatively that you cannot simulate in the lab. So it is extremely important that uh, one would be completely honest with himself and to not attempt doing any form of vascular surgery unless he had, uh, has uh, good uh, documented uh, success in the lab. Dr. Ahmad, may I ask you a couple of questions? Of course, sir. Um, very, uh, I, I was very impressed by your technique. Very nice uh, work that you've done. And these uh, high flow bypasses are very impressive. Uh, tell me, uh, when you're doing this radial artery uh, attachment to the uh, MCA, are you suturing the proximal end first or the MCA end first? Well, in the beginning, I was uh, performing the uh, suturing of the uh, MCA first. Mm. Uh, but later on, uh, and, and in the beginning, I was doing the whole procedure all by myself. I used to expose the radial artery, expose the carotid artery in the neck, and then do the cranial exposure, and then do the tunneling, and then do the anastomosis in the MCA, and then uh, do the anastomosis on the common carotid artery. But later on, uh, I, uh, when, when I was working, I, uh, because I've worked with two years for uh, open heart, with open heart surgeons, and I saw how they do the job. So what they would do is that they would have someone working on the patient's legs to harvest saphenous vein, and someone working on the patient's arms to harvest the radial artery, and someone else mm -hmm. is uh, doing a thoracotomy or a sternotomy to... Uh, 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 harvest the internal mammary artery, and then at the end, the surgeon comes in fresh, without being tired, to perform the uh, the anastomosis on the coronary vessels. So I carried on this uh, experience into our theater, and I started working along with vascular surgeons. So uh, they started doing the they would take care of the uh, extracranial part, and then I would take care of the intracranial part. But then <laughs> after doing that. Uh, and after doing so many cases, they started to become, you know, annoyed because they want to go in, they want to finish first, they want to say goodbye. So uh, <laughs> later on, they have some private work. So later on, what I told them is to go in and do the uh, proximal anastomosis first, and then we would do the tunnel and have a large length of uh, graft so that I could flip the graft as much as I want inside the brain, and then I would do the uh, anastomosis uh, at the MCA. It really does not make that much of a difference, uh, so long as uh, you can document that the vessel, because sometimes you might perform the anastomosis and you find that the anastomosis is not filling well, and then you'll have to discover whether the anastomosis is not filling well because there's an outflow obstruction or an inflow obstruction and so on which is all the problems inherent with lots of, lot, a lot of vascular surgery. But uh, performing what anastomosis first really does not make that much of a difference. Uh, but in the end, in the, end it's, the important thing is always patency. And, and what is your uh, experience with uh, Moya Moya disease in Egypt? Is it a very common disease? Is it is it, well, uh, is I, it? I, re I really cannot say that, that uh, whether I, I know that it's uh, a common or not a common disease because uh, all patients with Moya Moya disease in Egypt and over the Middle East are being referred to me. Uh, I, I really don't know how, how often they uh, can find them. 
but I am getting patients from all over the country and I am getting patients from all over the Middle East and I do operate patients with Moya Moya disease uh, at least uh, twice or three times a month. Oh, that's pretty frequent then. It's quite frequent, yes, but, but this is, you know, it's like, you know, uh, when working, for example, in, in, in KEM, you see everyday patients with uh, craniocervical junction problems. So yeah. it's, uh, th these are rare entities, but this is a referral center. So yes. you can't really say that basilar invagination or uh, atlantoaxial dislocation is an extremely common issue uh, in, in, in Mumbai, but you do see a lot of patients being referred. Do you see children more or adults? Uh, what was the distribution? Sorry? The distribution, age distribution, children more or adults? No, oh, and also no, children, children uh, for me are a living hell. Uh, doing a microvascular anastomosis on children is very difficult because the diameter of the blood vessel is very small. And yes. uh, in many cases, we would resort only to doing a myosin angiosis or an angiosin angiosis. And actually, the, the largest number of complications that I've had were the patients with a myosin angiosis, actually, in children. So, uh, because children usually, when they present the, the child form of Moya Moya disease, is usually more severe than the mm. adult form of Moya Moya disease. And mm. the uh, Moya Moya vessels in children uh, are usually, usually not just that they are smaller in diameter, but they are also very thin. And sometimes yes. the suture goes through and cuts through the vessel. So, uh, because mm. of the extreme hypoxia at a very early stage in life, so. They're, they're very difficult to operate, but they're not impossible. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. May I ask Dr. Hatim? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hagazi, for uh, this uh, nice talk and uh, uh, very nice uh, work, uh, actually. Uh, my question is, uh, what are your criteria to use the uh, 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 bypass, uh, either in addition or uh, uh, to, uh, in addition to clipping or without uh, clipping? Uh, what are criteria for that? And the second question is, what are your tips for to to know uh, the the permanent uh, long term uh, bypass graft thanks well uh, uh, it, it, with clipping or without clipping this really depends on the site of aneurysm because for example uh, with cavernous carotid artery aneurysms we rarely have to clip them we do have to uh, ligate the internal carotid artery in every case because this is the only way that the graft will, will keep functioning because uh, you will have to always ligate the native vessel in order to deflect flow into the graft because by nature blood will keep going through the native vessel and not go through the graft. So with ICA aneurysms, we always have to do a carotid ligation, but whether we have to do a direct clipping of the aneurysm or not, with cavernous carotid aneurysms, the ligation is usually enough. And with reversal of blood flow that results from a high flow bypass, the aneurysm will become completely thrombosed and ultimately will disappear. This patient that we've shown, for example, the patient with the giant ICA aneurysm, uh, he came to me one and a half years after performing surgery with his facial nerve function completely normal, with his hearing completely normal, because the mass that was inside the petrous bone had disappeared. And this had disappeared just because the natural history of the uh, aneurysm is to disappear once the flow reversal has taken place. So uh, long-term patency is extremely important because if the anastomosis functions well on table, it will keep functioning. The important thing of an anastomosis is that the anastomosis will keep functioning. And with experience, you start to realize with one look at the anastomosis that it's going to go on or it's not going to go on. Thanks, Dr. Hagazi. Uh, Dr. Hatem, uh, please, it's a time to go to the next uh, speaker, please. For the sake of the time. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the, uh, the second presentation um, for pro Professor Sorel, titled The Complication in AVM Surgery. Okay, thank you very much once again. Thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoy myself uh, talking to my good friends from Egypt and surrounding neighboring areas. So, uh, is my slide moving now? Yes. Com complications in AVM surgery. Yes. So, vascular malformations are arteriovenous malformation, venous malformation, cavernous malformation, capillary telangiectasia, and AV fistulae. These are various malformations of blood vessels. But AVM is the commonest and the most dangerous. It's a congenital lesion, which means abnormal collection of vessels, wherein arterial blood flows directly into the draining veins with no normal capillaries in between. And therefore, you have feeding arteries. You have an in-between nidus. And nidus is nothing but a tangle of arteries and veins connected by at least one fistula. And from the nidus, you have the direct draining vein. These AVMs can be static or they can grow. They can occasionally regress and sometimes just blow off. This is a picture. I don't know if you know, I'm also a photographer. And this is a picture like very much like an AVM, multiple feeding arteries with some one or two big giant draining veins. The commonest presentation of AVM is hemorrhage, 50% at least. The next common is seizures. Third common is headache. We also have some patients with mass effect, ischemia, brewery, hydrocephalus, and particularly children. They have hydrocephalus and heart failure because of the vein of Galen aneurysm. Peak age is 15 to 20 because they are congenital. They tend to present during young age. Mortality is 10%. It's not a small amount. 30 to 40% morbidity. Intracerebral hemorrhage in 80%. And the risk of hemorrhage is high because of high feeding arterial pressure. Sometimes it is because of venous flow outflow obstruction. That means venous stenosis. It's also because of the size of the aneurysm. Now you might say large size or small size. I'll come to that in the next few slides. Location of the aneurysm, association of aneurysms, and association of pregnancy. Some pregnant women tend to bleed with AVMs. The annual risk, the lifelong and annual lifetime risk is 2 to 4% per year. The, major, the risk of major bleeding is 4%, and the risk of re-hemorrhage was 18% among those people who already had a hemorrhage. You must remember that small AVMs, we may think it is small, but they are thought to have much higher pressure in the feeding artery. And they tend to present more often as hemorrhage than the larger ones do. So larger ones can just come with mass effect or with epilepsy. The smaller ones come with hemorrhage. And they are more lethal than the larger ones. So 7% of patients with AVMs have aneurysms. And most of them are located on major feeding artery, probably from the increased flow naturally. And therefore, when you treat, you treat the symptomatic one first. Although two out of three of these related aneurysms may regress following AVM removal, it may not always occur in everybody. So as I said, preoperative effects are steel phenomena, AVM and aneurysm, hemodynamic effects, high flow angiopathy, and post-operative with high hemodynamic effects are normal pressure, perfusion breakthrough, and occlusive hyperemia. Available treatments are multiple. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Primary goal is to decrease the risk of bleeding. That is the goal of everybody who's treating. So it could be treated by a neurosurgeon, microsurgery. It could be treated by an embolizing doctor. It could be treated by a radio surgeon, or you may not treat at all. You may just observe the patient. But surgery is a mainstay because it immediately eliminates the cause of hemorrhage. Stereotactic radio surgery is also now uh, widely practiced, and embolization, transarterial embolization, 
could be an adjunct to one or two. Hence, AVM should be treated at a multidisciplinary center with high volumes. The goal of treatment is to obliterate tinnitus. Surgery has immediate benefits of decreased bleeding risk. And SRS, though it is good, it takes one to four years to decrease the bleeding risk. It does not stop immediately, unlike surgery. So during the latent period, more than half of the patients have reduction in the bleeds. But after obliteration, almost all of them will have reduction in bleeds. Not all, but 88%. Combined treatment may, re may make the risk for AVM much lower than what you report by any single treatment strategy or by the natural history. So sometimes no treatment may be better than any treatment and therefore your case selection is extremely important. So now we have three options. Open surgery, you have the neurosurgeon standing and looking at you in the middle. You have the embolizing guy on the right hand side of your screen in the radiology department and you have the gamma knife or cyber knife chap looking on the left side in the radio surgery department. Now these three are, can treat the AVMs, but there should be shared knowledge about all modalities of treatment by this team together. What happens in most places, the surgeon is looking at one side, the, the embolizer is looking at another side, and the radio surgeon is looking at the third side. There is no communication among these two gentlemen. Finally, a neurosurgeon can do it all. All the specialists belong to the neurosurgery department. Open surgery, embolization can be treated by the same neurosurgeon. Embolization as a prelude to microsurgery, radiosurgery is different from that aimed at curing the AVM all by itself. And the radiosurgeon, cyber knife, gamma knife, are again the creation of neurosurgeons. You know, it was Lexel who discovered or who created this gamma knife. So, and uh, CyberKnife also at Stanford by Adler, also a neurosurgeon. So neurosurgeons are obviously very familiar with all these modalities. You know, are, are you all familiar with the AVM grading of Spetsla Martin uh, described long ago and you give them the points according to the size, location and the pattern of venous drainage. And uh, then we have Spetsla Martin, a Spetsla Pons classification. But what is important that the two equivocal factors in both these supporting grading systems is eloquence and compactness. And when you do a DSA, these are the red flags. Indications for embolization is a high flow fistula. I will show you these cases. Blood flow related aneurysm, venous aneurysm, stenosis of draining vein, deep vein drainage, feeding by meningeal arteries, and high blood flow stealing with ischemia symptoms. These are considered to be dangerous DSA findings. When you evaluate on the MRI, you see the phloids, you see feeding arteries, nidus, and the draining veins. You analyze the angio architecture very carefully before undertaking surgery. You see the tangle of vessels. You see from where you get the large feeding arteries. You see the large draining veins. And not all AVMs will show on angiography. There could be some occult vascular malformations too. So here you see a high flow fistula. Here you have a venous aneurysm. Patients bleed profusely from this blowout of one of these venous aneurysms. And you can have a stenosis of draining vein, which in turn contributes to bleeding from the nidus or from the feeding arteries particularly. So AVM surgery, surgical results are influenced by AVM related factors. That means the size by large AVMs, by eloquence, that means eloquent areas, deep-seated areas of posterior fossa, or by the presence of hemorrhage, AVM ruptured or unruptured in the past, by diffuseness, by compactness, and by patient-related factors. That means age, if it is less than 20 or more than 40, the neurological status, consciousness, comorbidities, and finally, the surgeon-related factor. That means his experience dealing with this kind of problem. Selection of patients for surgical aneurysm is only when the estimated natural risk is clearly exceeded the estimated risk for surgery. For example, lateral hemispheric AVMs can be graded slightly differently from the SP Martin, from this uh, uh, special Martin. You grade them as, I'm talking about hemispheric, lateral hemispheric. Grade one as up to two centimeters, grade two, two to four, grade three, four to six, 
and grade 4 larger than 6 centimeters. And when this scheme was related retrospectively to the surgical results in 49 patients, it indicated that the mortality and mortality rates were low for grade 1 and grade 2 AVMs, but were indeed higher for greater size of aneurysm of AVMs. So surgery alone for grade 1 and 2, surgery grade more than 3 is they would prefer embolization before surgery. The advantage is to eliminate the risk of bleeding immediately and seizure control improves. And I will show that to you in my case too. And the least advantage is invasive risks of surgery, as I'll show you in my case three. Preoperative propranolol 20 milligrams is given to minimize NPPB risks and perioperative labetrolol to keep the MAP between 70 and 80. Surgery is, my, as you saw in my earlier picture, most of them are embedded in the sulci. So it's a transcircle approach. You follow the veins, the veins will take you to the nidus, deep dissection of the nidus, coagulate the feeding arteries from all the sides, coming from above, sidewards, from below as well. Beware of the premature division of venous drainage because you block the venous drainage, your AVM will bleed explosively. Securing the ventricle, obliterated draining veins, finally at the end, and then you remove the AVM. Remember, post resection BP challenge to make sure that a BP goes to a high level so that you can see the smallest bleeding points. And sometimes you may miss out on small feeders, which can be very nicely seen with a BP challenge. Keen inspection of the AVM bed, hemostasis, residual nidus. This is one of the reasons why sometimes an AVM can bleed after closure and areas which are prone to NPPB. And you always should do immediate post-operative, either during the operation itself, do an angiogram or immediately post-operative. So that if you find something left behind, you can immediately address it. You cannot leave it for a future date because that, way, that AVM may bleed explosively. So as I keep on saying bleeding, 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 bleeding is the biggest single factor concerning AVM. It can be pre-operative bleeding, it can be intraoperative bleeding, or it can be post-operative bleeding. Let me show you. Now, when you're doing a craniotomy, you must have a very generous exposure so that you can have the full view of everything around, the draining arteries, the feeding arteries, and the draining veins. Your complication problems start right from the beginning, from the moment you open the dura. There you are. You see, this is a bleeding coming from a cortical vein. You stop over there, you go to another site. Another site is bleeding. So everywhere, these veins, cortical veins, are adherent to the dura. And you require more than two hands to stop this. Somebody to coagulate, somebody to uh, feed you with the um, uh, suction. And then you go on coagulating with your powerful suction on one hand. The assistant has another suction. And another, uh, with the other hand of the assistant, there is irrigation to clear the field. And you go on coagulating whatever veins are bleeding. You can't even open the dura until you have got all the veins secure. So this is the way you sometimes have this complication right at the beginning, even before you address the AVM. So let me see if I can fast forward it. It's not dragging. Okay. Anyway, that was controlled. After the dual exposure, you identify the borders of the AVM, identify the draining vein leading to the ninus deep into the sulcus, as I said earlier, and do the ICG to identify the feeding arteries and the draining veins. I'll show you the first case. This is a lady, young woman, 27 years old. She had an unruptured AVM, she, which was abutting the motor area. As you can see over here, the motor area, very close to this. Recent episodes of severe headache, that was all that she had. So we did an end. Uh, we did a, there was a, only, uh, the question was, do you treat this just a severe headache? If you go by the Aruba trial, this patient has never had a bleed. But my argument was that having a bleed in this pre-motor area would have spelled disaster and she could have been permanently hemiplegic. This is an unruptured AVM. We did an angiogram. 
it shows a profuse feeding from the uh, anterior cerebral artery, both pericalosal as well as callosal marginal, and some feeders coming from the posterior communicating, posterior cerebral. So, and it's right along the parasagittal area, uh, close to the fox cerebri, right in the midline. What do you do with this? Uh, do you offer surgery or do you consider continuing the patient with analgesics? And now I discussed with the patient, we did a preoperative embolization to some extent it worked. And then I decided on opening up and getting rid of it because I thought she was a young woman. She might, if she has a bleed, uh, it would be dangerous for her. And uh, the patient was well preserved. I thought it would be a good chance to give her a surgical option. Patient agreed. As, as I said, whatever is best in your hands, you go ahead and do it. So I went on, um, opened a craniotomy, did a white craniotomy, did a transcircle operation. The AVM was seen right on the surface and following it, using men, multiple temporary clips to identify the feeding artery and the draining vein. And, and then uh, I took some stay switches to help to maintain a little control on the, on the AVM. And as we went deeper, there were more arterial feeders coming from below. So everywhere there were arterial feeders, all peridinal. Coagulate them all and identify them all and then open up the draining vein. And then we had a good coagulation of feeders, hemostasis and complete removal of the AVM. This is the post-operative angiogram showing a complete elimination of the angiogram of the AVM and uh, very good circulation, cerebral circulation. However, so I did this immediate post-op. But what about the patient? And again, lift the right up. She's moving the right side well. Left side is normal. And this leg? What about the leg? Leg, leg. Oh, she's okay. saying no. Try to move your left leg. Any two movements, okay? It's a good okay. disappointment. She's disappointed. I'm disappointed that the leg is affected. Now, why do you think this happened? This happened because of the secondary motor area where the AVM was located. So there was a temporary, temporary paralysis of this. And postoperatively, after seven days or 10 days, uh, she recovered fully. And here she has come to, the, to my uh, surgery after the removal of the sutures. And she's completely all right and in, in good condition, fully recovered. But initially, I was a little shocked. She was also shocked because we didn't expect that. To happen, but the post-operative angiogram looks pretty good. So the problem was only recent headache. We tried treatment modalities like embolization. The decision of treatment was microsurgery, and the complication was lower limb paralysis. Fortunately, temporary. Lessons learned: minimum symptoms versus potential of damage. You have to make a choice. Case two is more complicated. Combined treatment of a complex AVM. This young man, 2005, seizures at home in Varanasi in North India. Multiple drugs since then. 26 February 2006, he had his first brain hemorrhage. So it started with seizures, then came the hemorrhage. He was seen at a very prominent institute in Delhi. CT scan with the SA showed hemorrhage from the AVM. He was declared inoperable. He was therefore suggested endovascular therapy. Free embolization attempts over six years at that institute. 2006, 2008, 2010. Despite that, in January 2011, he had a second episode of bleeding. October 2014, he then decided he was sent down to another center of excellence in South India, in Trivandrum, where embolization of ECM, ECA feeders and NIDAS was done. Fourth and fifth embolization was again attempted in 2014 itself. In April 2015, he had a third episode of brain hemorrhage. In May 2015, the residual AVM was treated with radiation. There was a scholastic setback. He could only pass up to 12th standard, but he was now doing BA privately. But the problem was seizures, continuous seizures. The increase in duration, increase in frequency, multiple drug therapy, multiple treatment modalities, all were exhausted. Embolization was exhausted. Uh, radiation was exhausted. Now what do you do? So finally he was sent to me after so many years in 20, 20, 2018. 13 years after this first episode. So I did a pre-operative DSA and we saw that number of meningeal branches 
temporal branches from the left MCA and the PCA, and the venous drainage into superior cytal sinus and the venal canal. So it was still a very complex AVM, and uh, we decided on making an operative strategy. We kept enough blood available for this man, and uh, let me show. We did an embolization in any case, just in case we can get some additional help, but it was not really helpful. Uh, so I did the operation on April 11, 2018. And this is a pre-op clinical. You can see that he is still reasonably well preserved. And, uh, but he has scholastic backwardness, backwardness. And I'm explaining the procedure to him. And then I'm operating on him. Circle approach as, uh, but this is the first open operation he's having. Vein still looks virgin. I'm getting a good plane of dissection, good sulcal dissection. Whatever vessels I am seeing on the way, I'm coagulating and cutting, coagulating and cutting. Doing my DS, my ICG as frequently as I am required to do to try and find out the feeding arteries and the draining veins. Very important to have this information so that you don't sacrifice a draining vein. And you can see the draining veins, they are still they are carrying a lot of blood. There are many of them are um, carrying arterial blood, they are arterialized. And I go on dissecting the sulcus using temporary clips wherever required. Again, you can see arterial feeders going into the AVM. I'm not draining, and then there's some uh, necrotic fluid that's coming out because of previous embolization and radio surgery. I'm going deeper into the sulcus, identifying more vessels, coagulating them, coagulating and cutting step by step. You will be surprised. There is really no bleeding. Whatever readers I am, whatever feeders I am seeing, I'm coagulating them and cutting them. I'm getting an excellent plane of cleavage everywhere around the AVM. And uh, deeper into the sulcus. Coagulation and cutting. So I'm actually going all around the AVM. Perinidal. That's a big nidus that you are seeing here. It is embolized. It contains embolic material. You can see the size of this huge blob. I will dissect it out free. I continue my dissection further. Still in the search of more embolic blobs. That's the second one coming out. Again, coagulating feeders. Even the thrombose veins are separated from this blob. And out comes the second blob. Continue my dissection, continue chasing the arterial feeders. And now here, I have to fast forward the video because it's becoming too long. So here we are going, doing repeated ICG again, checking out on the arterial feeders. By now, venous circulation has slowed down significantly. The brain has become lax. The veins are getting thrombos because of low circulation, because the arteries have been now coagulated and cut. The all those arterialized veins have become blue. The only last one draining vein is left, as you see. And finally, I'm doing the ICG just before disconnecting. Coagulating the arteries. There you are. There comes the last blob. And thrombosed veins, blocked. Clean arterial, clean brain bed, complete excision of the AVM. A little bit of surgery cell put all around. I guess I've done one more ICG to make sure there's nothing left. And, uh, and then we have, then we have the immediate post-operative. I take him to the scan room. I just check him immediately. He's still uh, intubated. We check him out. He's being taken to the CT scan. He's conscious. Immediate surgery, he's conscious. He's obeying commands. He's holding my right side well. Mind you, it's a left side AVM. And post operative, you can see the result on the mother's face. She is quite delighted. Postoperatively, he is clinically good. He has no deficit. 
and he has no more seizures, most important. It, this is the angiogram showing a clean, well-preserved arterial circulation, no more draining veins, complete excision, no nidus, no feeders, no draining veins. And for the first time since 2005, he's free of all seizures. What was the problem here? Intractable epilepsy, repeated hemorrhages, all tried treatment modalities, several times at embolization, radiotherapy, radiosurgery, finally microsurgery, no choice. What was the complication by all these treatments? Multiple factors, frequent hemorrhages, embolization, radiation therapy, but he had no complications following microsurgery, fortunately. Lessons learned, difficult options in a case considered to be inoperable at the beginning. He has had multimodal therapy. Case three. This has been given to me by a friend of mine. This is the intraoperative. He says it's the last clean image. This case was presented at the ICCN. Six hours post-operative, multiple clips, bad looking brain, bone flap removed. Post-op day one, decompressive craniectomy done because of this hemorrhage in the brain. Post-op day six, more hemorrhage, more edema. Six weeks and two months post-op. Six weeks, brain is still swollen. Two months, brain is settling down. Multiple clips inside. Six weeks post-op angiography, showing still edematous brain, middle cerebral artery, still lifted up. But circulation looks adequate in some territories, but blocked in some. Eight months post-op, quite a, a contracted brain and hemosiderin. 18 months post-op, infarction and some aneurysm clips. What was the intraop complication? We had arterial fetus, premature division of venous drainage, extensive bleeding along the deep margin, post resection NPPB because of the residual AVM. So there was rebleed from the nidus or cryptic fetus. The walls were <coughs> with everything in gel foam. And there was immediate removal of the entire AVM. Higher the grade of AVM, greater is the likelihood of complications. Remember this. So post-op deterioration occurred because of NPPB, whether it is post-op swelling or hemorrhage, loss of autoregulation, occlusive hyperemia, re-bleeding from a retained nidus, and post-op deterioration due to seizures. What were the other complications? Intracerebral hematoma, subgallial fluid collection, sterile meningitis, wound infection, post-op clinical, severe hemiparesis, but rather good communication. She studies and she completes in a Paralympic bicycling. So what was the problem? Problem was just headache and seizures. No treatment modalities were tried in this uh, 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 treatment, which was in the uh, rider uh, uh, ilocondaria. The session of treatment was straightforward, microsurgeon, complications, early venous sacrifice, torrential bleeding, post-op re-bleed, residual AVM, NPPB, and left with marked disability. Lessons learned, consider less invasive therapies for high grade of ABMs, especially those which are in or around the local areas. Show you case number four, a 35 year old right-handed male uncontrolled focal seizures with secondary generalization. This is a CT MRI of the brain, right frontoparietal large mass with calcification and draining in. So CT angiogram showed MS grade four, AVM is draining, fed by margins, by branches of art, MCA, pericolosal, PCA, and draining into superior cytosinus sinus with transverse sinus. So this is the video clip of the grade four AVM. This is a grade four AVM, neurophysiological monitoring, intraoperative ICG being done, temporary clips being applied in the same way as I showed you earlier. But this is an acute case with no pre-op tried methods. Here we are coagulating and contract coagulating, identifying the feeders, identifying the arterial feeders, multiple clips, strategically placed, and working perinidal in the white matter. All around multiple clips, multiple coagulation, as I showed you earlier, again, the same way, coagulation and cutting. And getting the clean plane between the AVM 
and the surrounding white matter. So you are assured of the complete excision of the AVM when you see good clean white brain matter around the AVM. So coagulate and cut, coagulate and cut. Put clips whenever you are in doubt and stay close to the nidus. And clip, coagulate and clip all the feeders which are entering the nidus, very close to the surface of the nidus. At the same time, close to the surface of the brain. So step by step, multiple feeders are coagulated and cut and the whole AVM is finally removed. And the draining vein at last coagulated. This is a grade four AVM. Complete excision done. The brain looks reasonably clean. Usually you would find the veins becoming dark blue and completely collapsing. And that is what you are seeing over here. ICG is being done. Does not show any residual AVM. And total excision done. Good post-operative scan, GCS 15 intact neurology. However, post-op CT shows local edema, pneumocephalus. On fifth post-operative day, there's deterioration. There's a NPBB. Immediate craniotomy is done, decompressive craniotomy. Post-op CT angioclose shows no residual AVM. And he was discharged on the 14th post-operative day with GCS 3 by 5 and one month GOS 3 by 5. And on one month follow-up, he comes with a 4 by 5 recovery. Now, case four, what have we learned? Risk factors were high blood pressure, resin, probably retained residual AVM, probably coagulopathy. Monitoring was done. Neurology, papillary reaction, vitals, action, immediate CT scan, cerebral angiography, and surgery. What was the problem? Uncontrolled seizures. Tried treatment modalities? None, except epileptics. Decision of treatment? Microsurgery. Complications? Delayed post-op bleeding causing hemiparesis, which is fortunately recovered. Lessons learned? Intra or immediate post-op imaging is mandatory. CT, CT angiography, DSA. Immediately. Not after five years, not after deterioration. So that we preempt post-operative complication. That's the lesson learned. I will show you the last case if I have the time. This is the most uh, uh, you know, amazing case. She had an AVM and underwent radio surgery. And she had a bleed. And boy, what a bleed. This is the lady, 35-year-old occipital AVM, female diamond jewelry designer. She had constant headaches for 10 years. She was diagnosed to have right occipital AVM in June 2000. She underwent gamma knife radio surgery in England, in Cromwell Hospital, in 2000. And there were no more. There was no more follow-up thereafter. Pre-gamma knife radio surgery scan was done. This was the pre-gamma knife radio surgery scan. She undergoes gamma knife radio surgery. That's the AVM shown. Follow-up only one follow-up after six months following gamma knife radio therapy, and you can still see. Some vein, some vessels, some draining veins, but there was no further MRI, no further follow-up, no MRI, no DSA for the next two years. Now what happened? She developed sudden severe headache, vomiting, diminution of vision of left eye, becomes unconscious. GCS three, one, GCS four, sorry, 14th August 2003, at 1 a.m. I'm having, I had a long operating day. I come home at about midnight. I'm having my dinner at one o'clock at night and I get a call. Sir, this patient has got, there was no CT scan. This patient just collapsed at home. The neighboring GP just picked her up and takes her to a nearby nursing home. They immediately intubate. But the patient has got dilated fixed pupils. There's the, immediately a neurologist is called. He declares her brain dead. They call me up at one o'clock saying that this patient is in, in, they got dilated fixed pupils. Now, uh, what do we do? We have no scan. We have no interim imaging from the time that she had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gamma knife. And a senior neurologist says she's gone. I said, never mind. It's a new case. It's an it's a, uh, urgent case. Let us immediately, within the next 20 minutes, I want to see her in my hospital. I will leave home and I will see her in the next hospital. By that time, the CT scan department is open, kept ready, scan is done, theater is kept ready. Everything done in 20 minutes. And I am there on her in 20 minutes time. 
we raise the last flap. Right parietal occipital craniotomy being done within an hour of the onset of coma. And you can see now what we are seeing. We are seeing a hematoma which has burst through the brain. It's a parietal occipital craniotomy, evacuation of ICH, neuroplasty is done, bone flap is of course removed. I remove a part of the hematoma. I still don't have an angiogram on her, but I have an old angiogram. I don't have a recent angiogram. So I would remove the clot just enough to give some decompression. I would hesitate to remove all the other hematoma. Although there is a big temptation, I would try to stop myself from removing everything. So only the fresh hematoma is removed. And I mean, I'm gradually dragging the hematoma out. There's some damaged brain material coming out. It's parieto occipital, fortunately, behind the motor area. I'm giving her some degree of internal decompression. I'm getting a little greedy, but the clot is coming out smoothly and safely. You can see I'm working with two hands with a tumor forceps, gently evacuating the hematoma with two hands, slowly, deliberately, gently. And then I must say, I must stop. I think I have enough decompression, internal decompression. And because if I try to remove more, I will make the AVM bleed. And then I have no recent angiogram. I don't know why are the feeders, where is the draining vein. So I have to stop. So here it is, I stop. Some tiny residual bleeding. I stop whatever is feeding. I stop the bleeding AVM very comfortably. I'm not considering any more removal. The brain is relaxed. And I stop over here. We remove the bone flap and close the brain. Next day, 18 hours after surgery, she's already opening the opposite eye. This was the right side. She still has a dilated pupil and has heard no palsy. But she's opening her eyes. She's already extubated. She's obeying commands. She is not hemiplegic. 18 hours post op after she was pronounced brain dead. Amazing. Post op scan, residual clot. Brain looks pretty good, pretty relaxed, no shift, no nothing. And then I do an angiography. Angiography shows residual AVM as you can see in the occipital area. Post clot evacuation angiogram is there. There is a draining vein going to the Sagittal sinus and the transverse sinus. There you are. So this AVM still requires to be removed. So three weeks after surgery, after the first operation, I go in again. This is an old video. VHS taken on VHS cassettes. And we are um, finding the brain, getting to the AVM pretty smoothly. There is really no challenge over here. We get to the arterial feeders. We don't have an ICG at that time. So all the arterial feeders are taken away through that damaged brain. And you can see some draining vein there. There you are. Work around in the white matter. Coagulate, cut, coagulate, cut. Same principles as you saw in my earlier operations. And finally get the nidus. Finally get the draining vein. And finally get the clean white matter all around. There we are. So that is the end of the, practically the end of the operation. Operation. All right. Clean white matter. That's what I want to show you. Yeah. Post-operatively, look at her. She has a normal angiogram, normal eye movements. Normal neurology. And there she is. Brain dead patient. 10 years post operative. I did one more angiogram to make sure there's nothing residual. And there she is. She has developed a mild Parkinson's. And she's on medical treatment. What's the problem here? Chronic headache only. 
treatment modality tried radio surgery decision to treat was patient's choice she wanted radio surgery she didn't want surgery she was afraid she had catastrophic ich and she was pronounced almost brain dead lessons learned frequent and regular follow up if you are doing radio surgery and the other lesson learned never give up even if she has got a bad hemorrhage and declared brain dead act with mercurial speed in the face of acute injury in the face of acute hematoma don't give up just give it a try patient is dead what are you going to lose nothing cerebral vasospasm is another complication it's a rare complication of avm rupture or after avm surgery isolated intraventricular hemorrhage associated with cerebral vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia following avm rupture don't forget anesthesia related, related considerations are also there for example excessive blood loss you must be prepared brain protection uh, maintain good cerebral perfusion keep bp challenge control and management at the end induce hypotension well if you are in great trouble with bleeding modest hypothermia is good and maintain electrolyte management this is the algorithm i won't go through that conclusion now management of cerebral avms is complex and demands multidisciplinary approach no single method of treatment may be applicable to all avms but i must say surgery seems to be the most definitive method of treatment because it eliminates the cause of bleeding permanently however like any surgery and even more related to cerebral avms surgery is fraught with numerous hurdles and complications and bleeding is of course the most challenging problem embolization and radio surgery are the other methods that can be employed singly or in combination with microsurgery sometimes remember no treatment may be more prudent than one that complications which are worse than the natural disease as the natural history uh, of the of the disease so i've explained to you all the other my ma'am uh, cases with different kinds of problems and different kinds of complications and i hope this covers the subject thank you very much for your kind attention and for your patience to continue listening to me and watching me for all these last few minutes thank you thank you professor uh, kiki torel for this nice and comprehensive presentation now uh, if uh, there is a question for this presentation and i will start with the first question the professor uh, if you need a second modality of treatment after surgery not before surgery uh, what is the proper time in your uh, opinion timing you see the most important thing is the residual avm is going to bleed and it doesn't give you any warning and i think you have to discuss with the patient what would the patient's choice be my patient my choice would be radio surgery if there is a residual avm at the earliest radio surgery if the patient wants if the patient uh, feels that the first operation has been too traumatic too expensive or whatever and does not want then you have to discuss it with your team for embolization and radio surgery and uh, and then discuss with the patient what is that they would like to have thank you any questions any other questions yes uh two 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 problems i would like to uh uh to point out and i would like dr torell's opinion on uh one thing is uh avms that do have a diffuse nidus uh because sometimes the nidus is so diffuse and the resection resection is quite difficult and it is these diffuse avms that huge really have a lot of on passage vessels uh yes. i like operating avms very much and uh i i have good experience with them but uh this is always a problem the other thing is uh ever since we've had uh embolization started having embolization and uh radio surgery uh the uh radiologists have been trying to convince patients that embolization and radio surgery either combined or alone can be regarded as a definitive treatment for avms which is not my own experience i have never seen embolization or radio surgery alone to be a definitive treatment of avms maybe very small avms but 
with the rest of AVMs, I don't think this is a definitive treatment, although uh, they keep telling this to patients and they try to uh, uh, convince patients and the patients actually want to hear this, that they can be uh, taken care of without having to go through surgery. So I, I, I would like to hear Dr. Dr. Torell's opinion on those two issues. Yes, very good point. Actually, I forgot to mention during surgery, I showed some Ampersage vessels. I forgot to actually demonstrate them. Uh, but it is a fact. Ampersage vessels is a fact in AVM surgery. It is even a fact in tumor surgery. Definitely. So whatever vessels are, whatever vessels are going into the tumor, into the nidus, you coagulate and cut them on that surface and allow the vessels to flow by. You should not, if you are in doubt, you do your ICG again and check it. At no cost, you should be sacrificing any of those. Even in tumor surgery, even in glioma surgery, I observe this. So you, it's, it's our fundamental duty to preserve all blood vessels, both arteries and veins, whatever is important for the patient. So yes, it is sacrosanct, ampersage vessels, no question. Whatever feeders are going down from them, you coagulate them and cut them. And it is, uh, you stick close to the nidus. And therefore, it's not a big challenge. Sometimes, of course, you cannot see from where the patient bleeds. The bleeding can be so torrential. And that is a time where you require to uh, keep prodding in. Put your cottons and, and try to locate the bleeding point. Have an assistant give you a clear feel. Unless you have a good, clean feel, you cannot get to the feeder. And there is no other option but to get to the feeding point, the bleeding point. The second question about multiple modalities of treatment. I agree with you. We are neurosurgeons. And if I feel... Uh, uh, unless it's a complex mm -hmm. AVM, you talked about multiple uh, multiple nidises. You, I, my case number two, which I where, where I removed so many blobs, I showed you. That patient had multiple nidises, and that patient had multiple uh, multimodality treatment. But as you saw, that they were still not successful in neither preventing his epilepsy nor preventing his hemorrhage. So this is a clear example. I mean, I've kept it deliberately because finally. What is the goal of surgery? Goal of surgery, as I pointed out, amongst all the factors, most important goal is to prevent hemorrhage. What is the best way to prevent hemorrhage? Is to eliminate the ABM by surgery. The second problem is seizures. What is the best way? Is to get rid of the focus. How do you get rid of the focus? You can shrink the ABM by your radio surgery. You can block it by your embolization. The focus remains there. And sometimes the patients continue to have epilepsy. So to me, if I can operate, I've shown you grade 1 AVM, grade 2 AVMs, and I've shown you grade 4 AVM also. So even all these grades of AVMs can be operated, especially if they are on the surface, even the grade 4 AVM can be operated if it is uh, approachable. But if it is deep-seated with a big deep venous drainage, then you have to make a decision. And of course, for everything, you have to discuss with your team you must take your team into confidence because you may sometimes fail and you don't want uh, uh, them to say, look here, I told you. So you must have a, a team decision, but the surgeon is the leader of the team, not the endovascular guy or the radio surgeon. Because the surgeon understands all the three modalities. They don't understand surgery modality. And of course, take your patient into confidence. I think that is quite important. Whatever you are doing, let the patient know. These days they go on the internet and they find out sometimes uh, things you don't even know or you don't even want to know or don't yes. want to know. <laughs> you see? Thank you very much, Dr. Turel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, any, any other questions? So, uh, uh, Professor Nasser, may, uh, may you close this? Thank you, Hatim, very much. I'm really uh, very glad about this uh, very, very important discussion in one of the important subspecialties, which is cerebral vascular surgery. We have listened to three great talks from two speakers who are very important. Professor Kiki Turel, my friend, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us such honor uh, for contributing to our webinar. We are always supporting uh, our meetings in Egypt and Africa. 
Thank you very much, Professor Kiki Torel, for accepting my invitation and for these great talks. I'd like to thank you, Professor Ahmad Hagazi. I'd like to thank the moderator of this session, Professor Hatem Badr. And I'd like to thank Professor Omar Youssef and Professor Samal Ghanam and everybody who contributed to this activity. Thanks to Utopia Eva, uh, Utopia Pharma, and thanks to the hotline company, and thanks to all participants. I would like to announce about uh, webinar number 16. Next Friday, we will have Joha Herlizlimi at 2 p.m. Egypt time, and Professor Sayouk from Senegal, and Professor Mustafa Mahmoud. Thanks to all of you for your contribution and support. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Professor Omar. Thank you, Professor Thank Ahmad. You. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Nasser. My dear friend Nasser, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So wonderful to see you. But I must Thank tell you, you must also attend my complications meeting. Every two months, we have this on the webinar on complications. And I'm I, always and disseminating. Uh, you you are go, you are doing a great job, really. Kiki, you are doing a very very good job, and I'm following your webinars. I'm always disseminating your fires in Egypt and Africa. Thank you very much. I, I, want I want to encourage more Egyptians to come forward. I'm sure we all have complications and we must be honest about it and be happy to share with, share with the other people. We learn from each other. We learn from each other. Yes, Thank that's you. right. Thank you, Kiki, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. Masalama. Fi Manila. Allah Thank you.